Sure. Um, from Maximus, this is Rochelle Briscoe, account manager. And I have our um, supervisor of the chat group as well on, Tylea. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Okay, so uh, next part of the agenda, um, so we're going to um, be looking at the minutes. So you should have received a copy of the minutes that Amelia sent yesterday from the August 14th meeting, and hopefully you've had a chance to review them. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Do I have a motion to approve? Yes. And do I have a second? I'll second. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the minutes for the August 14th meeting. All in favor? Aye. <laughs> Those opposed? And the motion is carried. Um, and I will turn it back over to Amelia. Thank you, Lisa. So we have a pretty packed agenda again. Um, Want to make sure to get through everything. We are going to start today, take the first 20 minutes or so of the meeting. We have two representatives from our call center here who are going to join as panelists for a discussion um, open to work group members. So we'll take 20 minutes to um, go through a panel discussion with a couple of our call center representatives before getting into our discussion for the rest of the meeting focused on the first part of the plan shopping tool, um, which we had started reviewing last meeting. So two agenda items, but lots to go over. So we'll go ahead and get started. So first, um, as I said, we'll take the first part of this meeting to host an informal panel discussion with a few representatives from our call center who Rochelle, I believe, introduced herself uh, just a couple of minutes ago. For some background, um, most of you know, we have a lot of different forms of consumer assistance for MHC enrollment and through Medicaid enrollment through MHC. Um, these assisters are trained to help consumers make informed decisions about their um, health plan enrollment, including determining eligibility for financial assistance in various programs, help with selecting the right plan, going through all the options, and then all the way to um, enrollment assistance as well. So they're experts in their field. They have a lot of really great knowledge and understanding and just invaluable insight on the consumer experience. So I'm really glad that we have two representatives who were able to take some time out of their day and join us today. Um, so I will go ahead and let our two panel members introduce themselves before they do that. Um, really quickly, just an overview. So again, we'll give about 20 minutes for this discussion just to kick off this meeting. I have a list of a couple questions on the next slide that I'll kind of get things started and ask a couple questions to our panelists, and then I'd like to just open it up for um, work group members and anyone else on the call who has some thoughts or questions that they'd wanna ask someone who just has a, a wealth of knowledge on the consumer experience and kind of troubleshooting through major issues that consumers ex experience when they're plan shopping. Um, so again, I'll kind of go through a couple questions. Feel free to be thinking about if there's anything you'd like to ask um, in the meantime. And to get started, I'll I'll go ahead and let our two panelists introduce themselves. So um, panelists, if you could share your name and then your experience um, and affiliation with the MHC call center just really quickly, that'd be great. And I will start with Rochelle Briscoe, if you could introduce yourself quickly. Absolutely. Um, like I said, I am Rochelle Briscoe. I am the account manager and act as the liaison um, between Maximus and MHBE um, for all the contractual matters or matters dealing with um, the call center leadership and um, call center supervisors management. And I have 
actually, Anthony would know this, but um, have been on the project since its inception <laughs> and left and came back. So when we were in a tiny little room with only about 30 of us and we started and we didn't know what this Maryland Health Connection application was, <laughs> I was there in the first class. Um, so I left and I came back and I am here since 2022 in this new contract now. Um, we also have Tylea on the line. Tylea, I'll let you introduce yourself. And she is in charge of our live chat function um, for the call center. She's the supervisor, and that is the self service, self help flora um, chat bot. When you ask to speak to an agent, she's in charge of all of those representatives that answer our live chat. Tylea? Thank you. As Ronald stated, my name is Tylea Gregory. I am our live chat team supervisor. Um, as she stated, I assist with the flora and any live chat assistance that's needed. And how long have you been here, Talia? I've been with Maximus since 2019. Great, thank you both. So kind of a wide breadth of understanding of our call center and then a lot of institutional knowledge, which is great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Rochelle or Talia before we get started? All right, hearing none, I will go ahead and pose the first question. Um, maybe Rochelle and Talia, if you just wanna take turns answering, we can start with Rochelle and then move to Talia. Um, you're welcome to elaborate on any points or you know, if, if someone answered the question fully, we can we can leave it at that, but sure. um, we can go ahead and just take turns. And I'll start off asking the first question. So I have two on the slide. I'll run through these ones before again, work group members, I'll open it up to everyone else. Um, if you could be thinking about any questions you might have. Um, so the first question, what do consumers tend to need the most help with when reaching out for in-person assistance with the call center? when it comes to comparing and choosing health plans? I would say for in-person in um, in person assistance, it would either be for verification of documents, um, if there is a language barrier, or some of our consumers that are not as tech savvy would prefer someone to sit beside them and actually help them with their application. Anything to add, Tony? Yes, I will also say consumers like to go in person to get assistance with plan shopping with plans that meet their medical needs. So having someone they can sit side by side to discuss each plan and what's covered and prescription. I think that's what they tend to need in person assistance with. Okay. Yeah. And Tylea, just to, if you could elaborate, so are, you, are we talking about individuals who have specific health care needs and want to make sure this particular prescription is covered or they have a chronic condition and just want to talk through um, what their coverage is under certain plans? Is that is that kind of getting at what you're talking about? Yes. And to add to that, yes, when you say specific um, needs, the CSC and the call center agents don't go too deep into, you know, medical, you know, diagnoses or such. So therefore, um, like I said, they would rather someone sit next to them to say, hey, because some people's specialists are their primary. We know you need primary care, but some people have such need for their specialists that they see them monthly. They see them every couple of weeks. So it is their primary. So they have to make sure that they match up. So even though we have the tool that they can choose, um, that they can choose someone and we could find the provider or find the, you know, PCP or doctor of their choice. Some people are old school and they just rather, you know, have that in-person help. Thanks, Rochelle. And I guess a follow-up to that, uh, are there age patterns in what you all see in terms of what people are reaching out for? So who's more likely to prefer in-person sitting down face-to-face? Versus I, I wouldn't say age because we don't pay too much attention to that, but I would say there are technology patterns, people that um, 
I wouldn't say dislike, but um, are used to the paper application or can't quite get into their account. And even though we can give them a password reset, they just rather you explain it to them. I see. Thank you. Does anyone have any follow up to those responses? Any follow up questions? Yeah, Diana. I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Okay, perfect. I'm trying to turn on my my video as well. Um, thank you so much uh, for for those for that overview of it. And where I guess my question is really about when it comes to health literacy. I think uh, one of the biggest complaints that I've heard with regards to you know just anecdotal you know evidence of of, what, of helping my friends try to get insurance um, is understanding what level they're going to need you know because of course like everybody is going to when you're when you're trying to figure out how much you want to pay per month for the premium but then like you know given what we've heard about folks who end up being on bronze plans but they didn't realize that they actually need to be on silver plans and they end up being essentially underinsured um because they can't afford the deductible and the out of pockets um does that crop up as as often when you're in some of the questions that you get Yes. And one thing um, to piggyback on what you did say was I do see the Medicaid to QHP transition playing a big part there. Mm -hmm. um, some people that have had, you know, families and kids age out that have been on Medicaid for a while and are now transitioning, especially after PHE um, or after, uh, you know, COVID to QHP has never seen paid plans before deductible mm -hmm. where we have no idea I, I always just walk straight into my doctor's office now I have to and that goes into the question number two um, Amelia <laughs> but now I have to figure out you know whether I want to pay for that PCP visit or go straight to the specialist because I know I need I, I may need a referral I may not so they're used to walking into wherever they wanted to walk into you know free of charge and now it's I have to make a decision on you know what's best for me and that decision dials all the way back to whether I pick a bronze, whether I pick mm -hmm. a silver, um, which one has specialists cheaper. <laughs> I don't really care too much about my PCP, but all those are um, all those are concerns of that you know crowd that came from Medicaid that's going over to QHP now. Rochelle, I have a question. Um, so I live up in Garrett County. And I assist the consumers that are um, in the Garrett County area or the far west um, connector entity. And one of our big concerns is always because of out of network. Um, do you run across a lot of people that are calling saying, I need something that I can go out of network because obviously Care First is the only one that offers any PPO plans where they would be able to go across state lines? I don't witness that a lot. They may mention it on the call, but as best practice, we do funnel a lot of these very specified questions to brokers in our Tango process during OE or our broker connect outside of OE. When it gets specified to that or something that we haven't heard before, we do, but we don't want to answer because we don't want them to choose incorrectly. We go ahead and hand right on off to the brokers. Okay. So they would specifically have those answers to those questions. Thank you. Great question. Thanks for that information. I'll so I guess I'll I'll go into question two and um I think this gets to the response that we just heard, but that's a great point that um Consumers transitioning from Medicaid to private plan probably have a lot more questions and a completely different understanding of the health insurance landscape, so maybe have different needs. Um, so we have sort of an idea of what they focus on when making a decision, what they need the most help with. Are there any other kind of major groups that have certain characteristics that, you know, there's patterns in what you find consumers are reaching out for assistance with the most. Um, it sounds like a lot of it is talking through health plans, understanding what's covered, cost sharing, all the co-pays. Um, 
and learning that all that is not standardized in private plans. They differ from plan to plan. So um, if panelists, if you could speak to any other patterns like that, you see commonalities of what consumers are reaching out about, what's most important to them when they're trying to talk through their options. Charlie, anything else? I have seen children that are aging out of their parents' employer-sponsored coverage. They tend to have questions um, what plans will match what employer-sponsored coverage they had. Um, I've seen, I think that's the majority of what we see outside of what we've already discussed. To that theme, yeah. new QHP, to that theme of new QHP. That's a great point. So new new to QHP, two different populations, Medicaid to QHP, young adults aging out of parents' plans. Thanks for that information. Do we have other questions from work group members? I'm going to... Be silent for a minute and give time if anyone would like to raise their hand or just unmute yourself. Feel free to do either. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Diana, go ahead. Uh, so, um, so I think the, the question that I had then is about age of the the folks that you're engaging with and are you seeing that there are certain modes of communication that are more popular with and you mentioned in person a lot of people like to come in um but given the fact that a lot of um the folks who end up needing to go on qhp for the first time since you know turning off of medicaid work kind of irregular hours which may not align with some of the navigators hours have you seen any, you know, requests for different a different approach towards engagement or some other modes of communication that seem to be more um, that are new and sort of emerging as as a as a uh, as a preferred way of contact? One thing I do, I do notice is that there is no gray area. It's either you need a hundred percent help and you want someone else to do it for you, or you are self serve all technology, you, you're good, you don't need any help. I'll do my own application, just reset my password. Um, the blur in the middle is what we don't tend to see mm -hmm. too much of. Um, Age-wise, of course, the older population um, does ask for in-person assistance. Um, they don't necessarily, I wouldn't say ask because they're already offered it because as of course, you know, you know, um, application counselors, navigators are already stationed at many of their doctor's offices and you know, um, social services or wherever they already go. So it's not as if they're calling asking for you know, in-person assistance. We may come across where they mention that we're to the end of the call and there's something extra that you need I, that I could not quite put my finger on or help you with. So you may need a little bit of extra assistance, but most of the population already pretty much went and talked to someone. And then I will add uh, um, a number three to that some people like several modes of um, communication. I've already went in person. I know what they told me, but I want to see what the call center would say via phone. And I might even chat and see if I get three different answers in three different assistances. Very good. Very helpful to know. Thank you. Other questions from more group members? Um, I did speak to the older population, but for the population that's um, a little bit younger in the 20s, 30s, or um, such that need in-person assistance, it may be primarily because of the verification document situation. I can't quite get it uploaded to my account. I need assistance. They don't, for the plan thing, um, for them choosing plans or such, they pretty much are okay with the um, consumer assistance workers finding one or talking to a producer on the phone. But if they need to go in person, um, it's pretty much because there is nothing else they can do online. 
Thanks, Rochelle. What, what, what would you say are the, the three most important benefits that a member is looking at when they're making a choice? I would say it is location. It's always location because we start by searching for zip code. Um, preference in specialty, like I was mentioning before, whether or not I have a chronic illness and I need my um, medication and I need treatment for chronic illness more than I need to see a PCP once a year. And for the third thing, of course, cost. And some people may toggle all three of those in different directions. Some mm -hmm. people may put cost first, but we do see location being a big one and what specialists co-pay. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Tom. And Rochelle, just to clarify, when you say location, do you mean location of provider? Uh, or of provider, you know? location of provider with QHP and then with MA for an actual MCO. What am I familiar with? What's in my area? Do I live next door to John Hopkins that takes priority partners for as an example? Thank you. Got it. Um, Tylia, did you have any any other thoughts or do you notice the same kind of same themes in terms of priorities yes. for consumers? Yes, I do notice the same things. Great. Thank you. Thanks. That was a great question, Tom. Do we have other questions? When I consumers need... call in, do they know what meta level they'll usually be going after in a plan type or do they more ask about uh, specific like plan designs? So, and I'll let Talia pick on, back on this if I miss anything, but that's two part for me. Um, one, one, it's the new to QHP people that have no idea that there is a metal level <laughs> involved. They just want to know what the cost is. Um, so we have to explain that to them or get them to a broker. But two, there are the people that have had year after year, you know, QHP, um, and they want to stay on their same plan. They already know, they already talked about it three years ago with their producer. They know silver works for them. They're now just concerned with, did the price go up or down? Some people are comfortable in what they stay in. Hope I answered your question. Tyler, you have anything to add? Yeah, so just to piggyback off of Rochelle, um, consumers, well, I'm gonna speak on chat. When they enter the chat environment, they normally already know what level plan they're interested in. They just want to confirm what they saw on the website to be true. They just want reassurance. Um, we don't really have consumers that chat and that are unsure. Most consumers know, I want a silver plan. Can you tell me the premium cost of Kaiser's silver level plan? So that's normally how we can navigate to determine which plan is best fit for them. Or like Rochelle said, we connect them to a broker. Okay. Yeah, that's super helpful. And like I'm on the Maryland uh, quoting site and, you know, obviously you can filter by different things. So if a consumer filters by like metal level, right. And they want to do like silver, there's what, like, I don't know, maybe 10 silver options. So it sounds like out of those 10 silver options, most likely that consumer is going to want the, the cheapest premium. Is, is that correct? Or is there other factors that go into it besides premium? I think consumers also look at the deductible amount. Most silver level plans, you don't have a deductible. So they normally gear towards lower deductibles as opposed to premiums or lower premiums. It's both. It varies. Oh, thank you. I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat one more time? You said that for the silver plans, they most times they don't have a deductible? Yes. At the 94, are you... Are you referring to most people who are uh, between 100 and 150 percent FPL? That that 94 silver doesn't have as deductible. Yes, that's what I mean. Now it's not all silver plans, but Got most it. of the silver plans. Got it. Yeah, that's the <clears throat> that seems to be the um, from what I was looking a little bit on the site as well, because that was the concern is that if you don't understand. I think if you're not entirely certain about like, you know, what the distinctions are, even within the levels, it kind of gets a little bit uh, confusing if you're trying to do this on your own. Um, I, have, I have a question.
question in regards to um, prescription coverage. Um, so do you explain to them, I mean, because it, it kind of depends on the plan too, um, but many times the brand name prescriptions, that's where it's going to have a deductible and some will have a uh, separate prescription deductible not having to meet the entire um, annual deductible, but they can be as little as 150 up to um, a couple of thousand. Um, so do you point those out or is that something that you redirect then to a broker? I would say, re I'm sorry, I didn't know. If we would, oh, yet. sorry. I would, sorry. I would say a broker. Go ahead, Talia. <laughs> to a broker a broker okay. this are are any are any members calling in and asking about chronic disease management plans i wouldn't say management plan but they do mention it in selecting an actual plan we don't get too far because we're not supposed to ask too much about medical um, background, but some people do call in very focused and say, hey, I have diabetes or I am on dialysis or I have HIV and I need meds every single month like clockwork and I need to go to the Kaiser building. Like they're very specific. So mm -hmm. we would know and we would take that information and basically try to carve out, you know, what they need but of course we can't suggestive <laughs> sell anything to them so broker it is we try to just pass them off to the broker when it gets a little bit too specific okay thank you for that information yeah, have a great question and to just i'm um, out of curiosity and piggybacking off of that a little bit do you do you guys have a sense of our consumers able to navigate at least to an extent the health plan different variant variations in coverage and if they have a particular like a chronic condition or something like that do you have any sense of how they view view the plan shopping tool and whether they see it as helpful or if they're more often than not calling in for assistance when they want to make sure that a plan has particular um coverage of of particular issue what I do see is that a lot of consumers call in equipped with what the doctor told them mm -hmm. or what their office already educated them with. So they'll call in saying, I know I have this chronic illness. I know I need X, Y, Z. So let me make sure I choose this one because this doctor's office that I kind of already researched accepts this. So they call in with a little bit of knowledge. And like I said, for those that have no knowledge whatsoever new to QHP, ask all of the questions because they're going from a doctor that accepted medical assistance to one that doctor may not accept private health plan. So they're starting from scratch. But the people that are choosing a plan that have had, say, job sponsored coverage and they have knowledge of private plans, just they make sure with their doctors first what they accept and then they call with that knowledge that's a great distinction that's so helpful to think through just differences in understanding and mm -hmm. different questions that are asked with different populations medicaid to qhp versus private employer to private qhp that's thanks rochelle it's helpful no problem and to add to that some people call in with the third option. I have, I'm full of third options, but <laughs> some people call in with the third option where it is medical assistance to QHP, but it's medical assistance, example, Kaiser to QHP, Kaiser. And we have to explain the distinction in the two. We have to explain to them, you, even though it's one same building, you know, it's different coverages. You may have to pay a certain thing and, uh, or, um, care first to care first. <laughs> so it we we have to just be very, very um, mindful of the consumer's knowledge and how much they know without saying, hey, how much do you know? So active listening. I love active listening. Thanks, Rochelle. That's great. Um, Steve, you have your hand raised and then we'll either let that be the last question or if one more person has a question, raise your hand, but we'll start with Steve. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd love to learn more about the broker handoff. So when you're working with the consumer and you're gathering all this information, how do you hand that off to the broker to like continue to work with the consumer? And I guess, how are these brokers selected? Are they local to where the consumer is located based on their zip code? Um, how does that process work? Uh, yeah, you want to explain Broker Connect? We have um, on our Maryland Health Connection website. So on our Maryland Health Connection website, the first option, it asks you for your current zip code. Once you type in your zip code, it'll give you a list of brokers within your area, and you can minimize it 5 miles, 10 miles, 15, and it'll give you the list of the brokers. Once you select your desired broker, it automatically connects. So you enter the consumer's telephone and email address and you hit connect. And that will connect the consumer's information now is sent to the broker. Excuse me. Um, and we provide the consumer with the broker's contact information and the brokers reach out to the consumers. Now this is only our process outside of open enrollment. During open enrollment, we have our um, Tango process, which we do them a warm transfer and connect the broker and the consumer before we drop off the call. Absolutely. And that's called our back phone initiative. During open enrollment, we can house on our phone system up to 50 brokers that sit and wait for us to warm transfer them um, referrals for anyone that was deemed eligible for QHP. And like we were talking about, either the people that want to change a plan from last year or have specific questions that the agent cannot answer that's not on the screen. And that's our rule of thumb. If it's not pretty much on the screen, um, pass, pass them off. We are a little bit more diligent with this during OE for the brokers so that we give them business past the call off. And is broker the first option versus having them work with a local navigator? Going OE for QHP, that answer is yes. Outside of um, outside of QHP, yes, they have several options. Um, we just go by what is on the website. They have navigator, they have application counselors, um, application counselor lists, uh, Healthcare Access Maryland. We have a, a we have a slew on the website. Okay, that we yeah. get from. Super helpful. Thank you. This is this is Tom Hamill. Just had one other question. Um, at our last meeting, we talked about making the website more robust with additional tools to help uh, uh, individuals make better decisions. Um, currently today on the system, you can look at, you, you mentioned diabetes, right? So in all of the plans, you have to provide the cost for, you know, average diabetes. Um, do you use that particular example to, to compare plans? And then do you currently use or, or do members use the system of low, medium, high to help make their decision on their buying, on their buying of uh, which plan they're going to select? I personally would say, from what I've seen, A, where is the, the low, medium, high, pretty much, we find if you choose one, a lot of people skip it, you could choose one for right now, and then we end up on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> so for the low, medium, high, um, it's just important for the agent to get to the list, literally get to the list of health plans rather than low, medium, high. We still ask the question, it's in our scripting, we still, we still ask the question whether or not they feel you know, that they need low, medium, high. But to be honest with you, um, the consumer does not really know. Some of, the, some of them just simply don't know and they just want to get to the list so we can read it to them. But I would say it is a little bit more my illness driven when we get on that page to actually, you know, help choose a plan. But we still have to ask the question. Okay. One concern certainly is a pick, individuals who qualify for a silver plan picking a bronze plan due to the high move. So we did discuss that maybe before they pick the bronze plan, there would be an additional warning that would make them aware of that higher move. Would, do you think that would help members make better decisions? You said higher and then it, you cut out. What was the word? After oh, that? higher than the higher move of a bronze plan versus a silver 94. Hmm. So, do you think if there was a, some type of warning just to make sure before they selected that bronze plan, if, if they were made aware, you know, 
unintended, right? You're, you're healthy, but if you break a leg or something like that, right, you could have a very high yeah. medical with, with a bronze plan versus a, a silver 94 if you qualify. I would say that that would be helpful. Every, every bit of extra information is helpful. However, um, people's needs change. So I, I am, I could be pregnant today and then in nine months need a surgery for my arm, you know, so people's needs change. I don't, I, I would say every bit of, bit of information is helpful, but I am not sure if they would use it to the fact of more than 80%, you know, um, um, using that factor to pick the plan. I would say it would be helpful, but I don't know if they would put that at the forefront of actually choosing a plan. And again, that's my opinion. So some people may find it extremely helpful. No, thank you. You're, you're talking to the consumer. Here, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, that is helpful. Thanks, Rochelle. I have one final question, then we should close out. But I did see Lisa Barrows. I thought your hand was up before. I just wanted to make sure there were no final questions. No, it, it was answered. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Um, I'll close out. Uh, maybe Tylee and Rochelle, you could just give 30 seconds to this question in your response. If based on what consumers are reaching out about, understanding that there's nuances in different populations, but based on patterns and what consumers are reaching out about, what information do you think would be more helpful to either include on our website or to bolster or display better on our website that would really help consumers understand our health insurance landscape, maybe without needing to reach out to an assister. Assisters will, you know, I think will always be needed and, um, you know, there's always gonna be that landscape, but if there's something that you think that maybe we don't include, in educating consumers that would be really helpful would love to know your thoughts sure um we're already working with our other contract monitor on um, mhb side to um to anything that we um find that would help all right so we're already working there i'll let talia talk to the the chat portion we're doing a lot of work with flora and trying to add everything um but one thing i will comment on not really to add but the information is there not being biased but the information is already on the website maybe navigational wise but the the information is actually already on the the website you could pretty much find a question to a lot on the website by you know search bars or really looking but there's a lot of info there before you even go to search um for anyone there's a lot of information so maybe if we could shift the focus a little bit more to navigation than adding because the info is there i mean you could answer any question it's the same thing and i see i lost talia probably on app all the information is inside of flora before you select chat with an agent however some people are very programmed. I do it when I do it with everyone. I'm I'm a repeat offender, but some people go straight to talk to agent. <laughs> they don't they don't need to look for the information. But in Flora, there is a lot of question and answers that are there before you even talk to anybody. It's the same thing on the website. There are a lot of questions and answers before you need a navigator. Some people are just preconditioned to I want to speak to a human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is just I'm already coming on here. I'm not looking for anything. I want human interaction. And I, I, I could agree that COVID has made a lot of us like that. But um, I wouldn't say add. I would just say probably better navigation. And that is what the CSC is for. Some people honestly do call us and ask for help with navigation versus do my application for me. We're able to explain what you actually need is on this page, that page, and follow along with the person because someone may actually call us with the website up. So hopefully I could answer your question without I'm off my soapbox. So. <laughs> no, no, that's that's great insight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um Talia, I saw you joined. Yeah, sorry about that. You, yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, I didn't um, briefly tell them about Flora Tylia while you were gone. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted to piggyback because I picked that on the last part of the and, and they just You're want going in and out. reassurance. 
Oh, what about now? You're good, go ahead. Am I still going out? I think it's better now too. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, consumers do tend to chat in and they just want to chat with the live person just to confirm what they see on our website to be true, just to confirm they're selecting the best plan, just to confirm that um, their needs are met and they feel like, okay, well, if I'm chatting with a live person, I can ask specific questions as opposed to floor is helpful, but it's more general. If they chat in with us, they're asking us specific questions to their specific needs, wants, or desires at that moment. Can I add also one thing for the group to just educate everybody that on the live chat option, we do not perform applications. So that is the difference between the call, calling in all the way and actually chatting. You will get G, your general inquiry question answered or you'll get a password reset or you may get um, application question answered like um, what am I eligible for? I did my application two days ago. What was the determination? But we do not go through the application on live chat, which makes it much easier for someone to just press chat with an agent and ask your quick question and be done with it versus call the call center. Thank you both for the responses. Um, Betsy, do you want to give one final comment before we wrap up? Sure. I just um, first want to thank um, Rochelle and Talia uh, for their hard work. Um, I'm Betsy Plunkett. I'm the Director of Marketing and Web Strategies. And I was wondering if you could expound, expound a little bit, Rochelle, on um, mm -hmm. the navigation of the website. Is there one or a couple um, areas where you think um, people could use more clarity. And Amelia, if this is not the appropriate um, forum, we could talk offline. No, I think that's a great question. And yeah, that could be quick. Michelle and Talia getting to when people are not going through an application, but just going through that initial plan shopping, get an estimate um, to Betsy's point. Yes. Areas the, that maybe they should be navigating to. Sure, I can make it quick. Yes, it is basically you have to hunt to, to find certain things. I'll give you an example from a call the other day. Um, I need to prove my identification. I need I need to know what's acceptable for my ID. Um, you have to choose several uh, keywords in order to actually find the list. You have to navigate to the bottom. I did it myself. That's why I know. <laughs> and there is a good, valid list. And it is spelled out. It is perfect. It's just I had to find it. It took me some time. So for the average agent, they may have to be on the phone and it's a learning experience for you and the consumer. Both of you are trying to find it at the same time. But once you actually find it, this is exactly what I need and consumer's gone. Yeah, so um, another um, thing is putting, I know you can't put everything on the front of the website, but that get my estimate button is perfect. It is there. It is one that needs to be there in the front. It's one of our questions that we can quickly send someone to that's sounding very iffy on putting in an application. They're not sure about the income. So things like that, that helps us. And we're able to say, as soon as you log on, you'll see it. It is one of the first buttons that's there. Some other things, not so much. We have to search. We have to kind of search. Thanks, Rochelle. That's, yeah, that's just good to think through and it's good food for thought. The get an estimate tool is what we're talking about and it's easy to get to, but maybe there's mm -hmm. room for improvement in terms of directly linking other tools and other info sheets in the get an estimate tool to make them easier for consumers to get to, and particularly things that they really need to be thinking through when they're choosing plans. So that's, that's really, that's great food for thought. Thank you. And, and Rochelle, if you think of anything else, feel free to email me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And Tylea, do you have any other final comments on areas for improvement, just in terms of information we're displaying to consumers, whether it's easy to get to, particularly from the get an estimate tool? Um, I think Rochelle pretty much covered what I was going to say, the get an estimate, um, because just within the live chat, that's majority of our qualified health plan consumers. They just need assistance with that part. Once you help with that, they say, okay, well, I'll finish my application or I'll finish my enrollment. And they're more comfortable with self-serving after that. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I know we went a little over time, but really appreciate your time. And like Betsy said, we just appreciate so much what you all do and they're tough jobs. So thank you for sharing your insights. Um, with that, I think we'll, we'll close, but just wanted to say thank you again to you both. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone for the questions. I think that was um, helpful. If anyone has any follow-up or just wanted to throw any other questions out, we can put it out in our universe and maybe get some responses after this. So if you do, feel free to email me. Um, we can always follow up with any other questions anyone might have. Otherwise, I will go through um, some of the content really quickly for today, just because we have a little less time for discussion. But essentially, I, based on what we've been discussing in the first and the second meeting, and then also incorporating a little bit of Hilltop's literature review, um, I've compiled some themes of you know major points that we've been talking about, and especially at the last meeting, um, what we what members highlighted that we want to discuss in more detail. So for the rest of this meeting, we are going to focus on just continuing the discussion for the get an estimate tool and particularly focusing on the first part of the tool. So that initial uh, consumer page with all the information they have to input, um, the second page that then estimates their financial assistance or uh, qualifications for other programs and then that healthcare utilization page that we spent some time talking about. So I'll go through some state examples based on some of the major themes that we've been discussing. And before we get started, I also just included a disclaimer on this slide. Um, an important reminder that we thought about after our last meeting was we are focused on private health plan shopping in this work group, but at least for that first part of the get an estimate tool, that first page, all the information that consumers are inputting also checks to see whether they qualify for Medicaid. So there are going to be some nuances in what's on that page that are related to checking to see if a consumer is eligible for Medicaid. Um, so just wanted to remind that and we'll touch on a couple of things that are related to that, um, but just sending that as a reminder. So what I'll do now, I'll go through really quickly our review of our discussion, important points. And then from all those important points that we've discussed, I've pulled some state examples of how other states are addressing these issues and we'll review those really quickly and then we'll navigate to the get an estimate tool again and hopefully spend um, 15 or 20 minutes on the get an estimate site talking through saying way we did last meeting, just going, you know, open discussion with members. So that's the plan for the next 25 minutes. Um, I'll get started with overviewing of major points that we've been discussing the last couple meetings. So in the first meeting, there were a couple of things we talked a lot about considering whether we should be asking other questions besides just that healthcare utilization question, which asks the consumer, do you have low, medium or high usage? So thinking about other preference or cost preference questions that we could be asking consumers that would factor into um, what we're recommending in terms of plans or how we're sorting. A um, couple of people talked about online trainings, maybe video tutorials for consumers to help understanding how to use the plan shopping tool, help understand how to shop for a plan. Someone mentioned discussing immigrant consumers specifically and nuances and maybe how they access information. For our meeting two, we talked about uh, quite a bit. So there were a couple comments about the on the first page of the plan shopping tool when consumers are selecting the coverage you need in that drop down, um, making sure we're educating consumers about dental coverage and dental coverage requirements, educating them about standalone plans and adult dental is not necessarily covered in a qualified health plan, um, asking, looking into more whether consumers understand that no coverage option, you can, you know, add a household member and select no coverage um, and just understanding why that's important to do because that impacts the you know, your household size, size and financial assistance that you're available for. So kind of looking into that more to see if we can improve that. 
We talked a lot about the pregnancy question, whether consumers understand why that's asked. That gets to um, Medicaid determinations. When um, a consumer is pregnant, they qualify for different levels of Medicaid coverage or different programs under Medicaid. So uh, maybe adding a little bit more um, explanation to the consumer of why that question's asked. Someone mentioned we should edit the income sources box on that first page to say gross wages, salaries, and tips as income that they need to factor in when they're um, giving us their total income estimate. So it currently says wages, salaries, and tips. So adding gross wages. We talked about the chatbot functionality, whether that should be displayed more on the plan shopping tool so consumers know that's available to them. Um, whether we should be notifying consumers that there are various forms of free assistance throughout the plan shopping tool. So, you know, having notices about our call center brokers, navigators, et cetera. Um, and then maybe thinking through more if we can be incorporating illustrative examples, video tutorials, et cetera, throughout the tool. And then lastly, um, I'll go through these quickly, improving how our information about our estimated financial assistance is dis displayed. We had pretty long conversation about that and areas for improvement there. And then also improving the explanations for that health expected healthcare utilization question. So making sure that consumers understand what they're being asked, the ramifications for you know, saying that you have lower healthcare costs, but what happens if you have unexpected health needs? Um, just thinking through that question more and making sure that we're giving consumers the information they need to make a good plan choice. And then a couple more from the review of the Hilltop Literature Review. There's other recommendations about displaying more information prominently. So we're educating consumers about what health plans cover throughout the plan shopping process. Um, other tools that generally help educate consumers on health insurance com concepts and improve health literacy. Um, and then also including narratives about health insurance, particular like specific health insurance situations um, and going through examples of how others have made plan choices to help improve a consumer's understanding of what they should be considering. Uh, any comments, questions? All right, so I'll again run through these quickly, but based on those discussion points that we've been having the last couple meetings, I've pulled quite a few examples and screenshots from other state-based marketplaces and what they do maybe differently or um, if they address something that we don't related to those. So I'll go through these in the next slides again really quickly, but if someone wants me to stop on a particular slide, let me know and we can discuss a little bit more. Um, we can just plan to have the next 20 minutes is an open discussion, but I do want to be cognizant of time and make sure that we can navigate to the plan shopping tool one more time today, just so we can review it together and see if anyone has any other thoughts. Um, so the first state example related to um, decision support tools that help educate consumers on health insurance concepts. This is an example from the Minnesota plan shopping tool, which when you get to their um, landing page, you would click on how to choose a plan, which would get you to their plan shopping tool. But when you click on that, the consumer is first directed to this um, how to choose a plan page before they get to the shop and compare plan shopping tool. And it provides a link to all these helpful resources like understanding your healthcare costs, learning about plans. Um, there's a link that consumers can click um, if they just immediately want assistance in picking a plan. So this is a landing page that I don't think we have right now that um, I think to the to Rochelle and Tylia's point just provides a list of, you know, all this really helpful information that maybe MHC has on various points of our website. They've listed it pretty cleanly on the front um, right before you can get to the plan shopping tool. Next example is from Rhode Island. So talking about video tutorials, they are a good example of a state-based marketplace that has a video tutorial that consumers can click on and go through before they actually get to the plan shopping tool. And it explains how to use the tool. It explains best practices in shopping for a plan. Um, so that's a, Rhode Island's a great example of that. Related to the pregnancy question, 
uh, I pulled an example from Connecticut. This is how their state-based marketplace does it. They have that hover over option um, where consumers can get more of a description on why they're being asked if a household member is pregnant. Understanding household size, I pulled a couple examples. So the Colorado marketplace in Massachusetts, both give a little bit more of a disclaimer of why it's important to include all members of your household. Um, and in particular, you know, a household member, even if you don't need coverage, why they should still be included when you're looking for your financial estimates and you're looking um, to understand all your options when you're using the plan shopping tool. And then a couple examples from other state marketplaces that have great reminders about the forms of assistance that they have. So um, if someone feels like they need more assistance or maybe they should be directed there instead of using the plan shopping tool, Massachusetts has a disclaimer that pops up before they get to the plan list page that provides a link to their help center. And it reminds that you have free assistance available to you, particularly through their navigator program. Colorado does something similar. They have their link that's very clearly displayed throughout their plan shopping tool. If a consumer um, wants more assistance, needs advice, you can click on that button um, and they're taken directly there. So both of those are states that are good examples that prominently display get more assistance throughout their plan shopping tool. Displaying estimated financial assistance. This is something we talked a lot about at the last meeting. There was a lot of feedback that we might have uh, some room for improvement in terms of how we explain financial assistance like the tax credits, cost sharing reductions on that page for our MHC tool. So I just pulled an example of Colorado. Um, this is how they display their financial assistance. So after you go through the initial input um, of information for a consumer and they get to their estimated financial assistance page, this is how it's um, explained to Colorado consumers. Um, it's a little bit more detailed. It explains both tax credits and cost sharing reductions. It terms them lower monthly premium and lower out-of-pocket costs, gives a little explanation of them. And then it also prominently displays the importance of choosing a silver plan if you would like to apply CSRs and that you can only receive CSRs through a silver plan. And it also includes a prominent hyperlink to each insurance term. So if you want to learn more about CSRs, it has those hyperlinks in there. So just pulled this as another example of how other states display their explanations of financial assistance and estimates for financial assistance to consumers. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the expected healthcare utilization question um, and whether or not we could be making improvements there and adding things to it. So Connecticut, is an example, this is the first example. Um, they allow consumers to check each question individually, their estimated um, doctor visits, labs, image and testing, prescription drug use. And then it also has a disclaimer at the end of their um, healthcare utilization question saying, plans with the lowest monthly premium aren't always the cheapest plan for you and your family let us know how you think you and your family might use this plan in 2023. I pulled this last year, but that's generally what their um, healthcare utilization question looks like. Um, same line, expected healthcare utilization. There was discussion about whether um, MHC could include a drop down of common procedures that consumers could check and say that they definitely need coverage for. There are quite a few states that do this. So I pulled DC as an example. Um, something that could be explored with this. So for the states that do have this drop down where consumers can check common procedures that they want coverage for, um, I haven't looked in this, but it's something for consideration, maybe for another work group meeting, but how, to con how do other state-based marketplaces use that information? Are they auto sorting plans based on expected cost sharing for those procedures? How are they displaying that in their plan tiles if they are at all? Um, but a lot of states do do this, so I put you see on here as an example. There was a comment too about making sure we're explaining separate dental coverage, making sure consumers understand that adult dental is not um, 
an essential health benefit. It's not required to be covered under QHPs. Um, and so making sure that for consumers that also need dental, that they understand that they might have to purchase a separate dental plan. I've not seen other states that discuss adult dental specifically, but Nevada here is an example that gives a disclaimer about pediatric dental and how pediatric dental is not necessarily covered under all qualified health plans and that they need to be making sure that they're checking that if, if that's important coverage. Um, if it's not covered in, under a plan, they need to buy a separate standalone dental plan. Robin, yes. Yes, for, for here um, is, uh, I guess some maybe some early thinking, not about the children's because I know there's legislation passed so that we're not going to have standalone um, children's dental programs, but kind of something similar that some qualified health plans that they all include children's, but they do not all include adult and that adults may have to purchase uh, it separately or something like that. Yeah, we would definitely, of course, have to tailor it to our Maryland specific regulations since we're ahead of the curve and we require pediatric dental in our qualified health plans. Um, it's a good point. And I'll, we'll note that as a consideration if this is something that work group members think is important that we're educating about dental coverage and how we would incorporate that into our plan tool. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Robin. Um, I'll be super quick. We'll go through these real, real quick. So this is another example. Um, we're getting into cost preference questions, which MHC doesn't necessarily do yet, but here are some examples from other states that do. So California asks you to choose, um, you know, for a consumer, do you prefer a lower premium with higher cost when you get care or a higher premium with lower cost when you get care, trying to get at what the cost preferences are for a consumer? New Mexico is a great example of this. They have a cost preference question and they provide a narrative about varying cost sharing under different plans. So there's, you know, they have three options essentially. Plan, do you prefer plan A, plan B, plan C? Plan A has the lower monthly premium, higher cost sharing. Plan B has the higher monthly premium, lower cost sharing. And then plan C is somewhere in the middle. And then, they give scenarios for each of those different plans. So for example, um, plan B, I know it's really hard to read, but um, the example under plan B reads, for this plan, you would pay $475 per month, but you would pay $0 out of pocket if you needed surgery. So $475 a month or $5,700 per year. So with plan B, you pay $5,700 whether or not you ended up needing surgery versus the examples from um, Plan C, for example, they, they kind of outline you have lower costs, but you pay $1,500 if you needed a surgery. Um, however, you pay, so they outline, you know, you pay $4,500 if you didn't need surgery and you were just paying your lower monthly premium, or you'd pay $6,000 if you ended up needing unexpected surgery. So it outlines different examples. Um, of what can happen with your cost, depending on the type of plan that you purchase. Um, and then I think lastly, a couple states provide really prominent displays about their provider directory and notifying consumers that provider directories are not necessarily always fully updated and that you always need to make sure that you're checking with your health plan, you're checking with your insurance company to ensure that your provider is covered before you actually choose that plan. So making sure that's prominently displayed. With that, um, are there any other questions before I'm gonna stop presenting and we'll navigate to the get an estimate tool for the next 10 minutes for final discussion. All right. So with that, I, oh, yeah, Amelia, this is, this is Dinesh, yeah, question. Um, when you looked at other state agencies, apart from these, um, the textual help, is there any other um, innovative way of engaging this customer, like a chatbot or, you know, RA-enabled uh, textbot? Is is there any, any other form of engagement they used, or they have used just the text information? That's a good question, and... 
I honestly only picked up on AI in the last six months, but I, a lot of these examples were pulled from last year. So it's possible they've been updated and I just haven't reviewed them, but I'm happy to go through them again and see if there's other examples of that. I think I did pull one where one state, you know, lists their, they have their kind of chat box at the bottom of their screen as people are going through the plan shopping tool and it's more available. So consumers are more easily able to use that and navigate to it on the plan shopping tool if they want to stop at any point and just speak with someone or put a question in directly. So I'm sure that they do. And um, I can look into that more and see if there have been updates in the last year to what other states are doing in that arena. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. I will go ahead and in the time we have left, navigate to our get an estimate tool. I know that was, again, a lot of information. We don't have a lot of time to discuss things in detail, but just going through those state examples and what other states are doing, um, wanted to have one kind of final continuation of our discussion from last week, specifically related to this first part of the tool. So all the information input, the pregnancy question, the questions listing who you should include in your household, what income to include when you're estimating your annual household income. Are there any other thoughts on this page of things we discussed last week that anyone wanted to elaborate on or based on other state examples? I did have a really quick question. Um, when you say like for wages, salaries and tips, is there anything for folks who are in the gig economy or who are like, you know, sort of part-time workers, because those tend to be a lot of folks who are coming to the exchange to get care if they, you know, they don't qualify for Medicaid because they make too much, but it's uncertain about their salaries. Yeah, um, this is pretty generic information. We do have this button here, learn more, and it provides a much more detailed breakdown of what to include. And we also have an income calculator that consumers can use. That's usually what they, they navigate to that as they're actually going through the application and uh. to actually the plan. Um, so yes, it's not, I think that information is available. It's, but the generic information we display on this page doesn't necessarily accommodate to those more particular scenarios you're talking about, but it is a good point to think through who's purchasing and um, Would we what... link to the calculator? I'll, I can double check this link, but I think that when you click on this, learn more here, it should, yeah, it actually does link to it already, Diana. Oh, It'll fantastic. link to it. We have our, yeah, we have our um, income calculator. So it does link to that. Oh, fantastic. Sorry about that. Thank you. That's great. That's a good, no, good point. That's a good point. Any other comments on this page? I'll move on for now, but we can always go back if we have a little time. So next page is that estimate of financial assistance. We had a whole conversation about maybe needing to provide more explanation here and making it more consumer friendly, how we're going through what financial assistance this is, what it means when you qualify. Um, we have currently these hover overs that give a little more information on each of these. So cost sharing reductions, the premium tax credit and our state assistance. Um, Do we have other thoughts on this on this page? This one would include the young adult subsidy, right? If you do, if you're, it includes and the calculation. Okay, great. It Perfect. does, yeah. yeah. And those, yeah, the state subsidy is included in the cost estimates on the plan tile page too, yeah. Would it help to, if there's any information about how it's going to be applied? Because one of the things I've heard is whether, you know, you pay up front first and then the state pays you back, or is it that the state will pay, like, you know, just to help alleviate some concerns that folks may have? That's a great question. And I'm not sure if I've seen that on other state sites, but I will maybe look into that a little more because that's a really good point is clarifying like the state subsidy 
it's not a tax credit. You just receive it um, versus the premium tax credit, maybe going into a little more explanation of implications for that. Um, yeah. And how they're, yeah, that's a great point, Diana. I will, I'll look into if other states great. go Thank into you. a little more detail about that. Yeah. Anyone else have any more thoughts on that or anything else on this page? I think some main points we talked about at the last meeting were related to health literacy and making sure consumers understand what this page means. And to Diana's point, how this financial assistance is applied. Um, if we have any other thoughts, feel free to shout it out now. I'll give another minute, another couple seconds. Amelia, I know from um, when I've done enrollments and I've had people when they've come in my office for the first time that when I'm going over um, the explanation of um, this tax credit and how it's applied, there are people that are under the assumption that that they have to pay that in their taxes. And so I don't know if it's if it's just the wording, because I know I think it's kind of confusing myself where, you know, if I always try to stress that if you put an income in the application that ends up being much lower than what your taxes reflect. So if you're saying that your household income is thirty five thousand, but then when you're um, taxes the next filing, they're 80000 obviously you're going to be paying a bunch of that tax credit back. Um, but I think when they see this figure, so like the two fifteen there, they're thinking that they're going to be paying it back in their taxes or they have to claim it on their taxes. I see. Yeah. I know there's a lot of confusion about how the tax credit works and it's I think there's there's definitely we should have more of a discussion about how we're explaining because there's just so many implications to it. And we've definitely heard of consumers who, who do have to pay a good chunk back because they estimated their income incorrectly. So I think it's it would be a good discussion to continue to have if we can try to incorporate it into another meeting. Um, I'll make a note that we've kind of specifically focused on how we're describing the premium tax credit and making sure consumers understand what it means, understand how it's applied. Um, if that's, did I get that right, Lisa? Just yes. kind of. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. Well, for the sake of time, um, we will leave this part for next meeting, discussing the healthcare utilization question. I will send out these slides so you guys have all the state examples that you can look through. Um, if you have any free time, depending on, on what your guys' schedules are, but if you have other thoughts, we can discuss them at a later meeting and I'll make sure to pick up where we left off at the next meeting so that we can get to that part as well. So, we will go ahead and leave it there. I'll walk through next steps really quickly. Um, last thing to note, again, I'm sending out these slides, but I linked all the state-based marketplaces, their plan shopping tools here, um, just for easy access. So you guys can look through those as well if you wanna get ideas of what other states are doing. And then next meeting will be um, three weeks from now, not two weeks. So. We'll be meeting Wednesday, September 18th at the usual time, 1230. I have our tentative agenda up here. Washington State will join us and they'll discuss how they provide tailored plan recommendations. And then the rest of the meeting will pick up on this discussion and then getting into that later part of the plan shopping tool. Um, again, in terms of the calendar invite, I will send out an updated calendar invite so everyone has that and it everyone has September 18th, 1230 in their calendar. Um, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Any public comment? All right, with that, I think we're good. Thank you everyone for joining and we'll see you in three weeks. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks all. Thanks. Yep, thank you, Amelia. Thanks. Thanks, Alrighty. Everybody. Bye.